Hi everyone, this is Nathan again with People's Town Hall. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, for those that don't know, People's Town Hall is a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization dedicated to the simple idea that our democracy is stronger and better when lawmakers uh, take the time to meet with and listen to the, the folks they work for, their constituents. So we're in a difficult time, hopefully coming out of this difficult time pretty soon, where um, in most of the country, you know, it's not uh, medically uh, responsible to have these meetings in person, indoors, in close quarters. Uh, so we are doing the best we can to facilitate the next best thing, uh, this series of virtual town halls. So today we are in Lincoln County, out on the beautiful Oregon coast. Uh, I am not there, but uh, Senator Wyden is in Newport, Oregon, and we've got folks uh, from across uh, Lincoln County joining today uh, to ask some terrific questions. Uh, Senator Wyden, thank you again for joining us. Nathan, thank you for doing this, and to People's Town Hall, we so appreciate you're throwing open the digital doors to government, and I've had more than 570 in-person town meetings. We can't do those right now, but we're still interested in making sure government's accountable. So we want to hear from folks in Lincoln County. And I am, in fact, uh, at the Newport News Times uh, this morning, and we want to thank them for providing the venue where you can basically pop open a laptop and hear from folks in the county. So the point of all these town halls, and Nobody had ever done this in Oregon government, said we're going to open opportunity every county every year. And uh, the point of it is to shorten the distance between the Oregon coast and our state and Washington, D.C. And I'm just going to tick off a couple of items and then we'll <clears throat> throw it open. Now, the recovery plan, the American Rescue Plan, has a number of provisions that are hugely important to the coast. For example, the state and local portion will bring about $13.8 million to the county to ramp up vaccinations, safely reopen schools, support our small businesses, I'm just at the aquarium, looking at um, things like PPP and, uh, and the venues provisions and the like. It's all about helping uh, communities move forward. Uh, we were able to get additional aid in the CARES Act for our state's signature fishing industry, $15 million this past January, and another $13.5 million at the end of the fishing season uh, this year. Wildfires, of course, have clobbered uh, the county. So I've been working with FEMA to deliver critical disaster funds for Oregonians devastated by the Echo Mountain complex fire that tore through hundreds of homes and structures. Lots more to do, but I am gratified that more than 250 people and households here in Lincoln County have been approved for more than $2.4 million in grants through FEMA, and we've got some of those folks um, with us. Help through the Small Business Administration, low interest disaster loans, close to $7 million, been approved for 54 homeowners and renters, uh, almost $2 million in grants for housing um, repairs. And let me just mention a couple of other issues that I know are critical to the county. One, in the water resources bill uh, last year, we were able to get uh, $2 billion for funding directed towards maintenance projects that upgrade jetties and levees and breakwaters. And you know those are critically important uh, to the Oregon coast. We work with the community uh, college, uh, the port, uh, Lincoln County School District, to get federal shipbuilding uh, grants to outfit a 12-bay welding training lab. And even with uh, all the divisions back in DC, these kinds of efforts, these kinds of policies show that you really can uh, work on constructive matters to shorten the distance. So uh, I wish we could be doing this in person, I would say to Lincoln County, but this is your time to educate me and um, let's just have at it, Nathan. 
Terrific. Uh, we've got a number of folks here live uh, on video asking these questions, uh, but we definitely should have time for some of your questions in the Facebook comments. Uh, so I already see a few great ones. Um, and, you know, keep those coming, keep the dialogue coming. Um, and if you're on Facebook, do share this video uh, on your own feed to let folks know in, in Oregon uh, that we're having this conversation this morning. Uh, so first up, let's go to Michael in Seal Rock. Hi. Good morning, Senator. I appreciate uh, the town hall today and welcome to Lincoln County. I'm calling or talking from Seal Rock. Wonderful. Yeah, it's a beautiful. So my question, and it's a main question, uh, there are so many, but my concern is the um, wildlife killing machine called Wildlife Services, which killed probably more than 400,000 native um, wildlife last year. And a lot of that is with um, leg holds, snares, uh, poisons and things like that. And it indiscriminately kills pets, uh, injures children, things like that. And I was wondering if Congress has been uh, discussing any uh, anything about this, like maybe disbanding it or putting uh, or watching them closer. It's just ridiculous. I, I think clearly, Michael, uh, there needs to be more oversight and more transparency here because these are serious issues. And I know Congressman DeFazio has introduced a bill right. to ban it. And um, if you're talking about, you know, poisons and poisons that could have implications for households in Oregon and the like, doesn't get much more serious than that. So you get me this information from the seat of my pants, because I heard a bunch of people call in and say they wanted to ask about this issue, but you're not um, alone. My sense is there needs to be more oversight, more transparency, and I'm looking at the various pieces of leg legislation on it. But if poisons are getting into the households this way, that's serious business. Right, I could, okay. I can get you that information. I can call your office. I Good. appreciate it very much. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for being a part of this. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Michael. Uh, next up, we have Betsy from Newport. Hi, uh, Betsy Bredo. Um, Senator Wyden, we are really fortunate to have you and Senator Merkley representing us, um, you know, for Oregon. Uh, and I'm kind of still concerned about the Citizens United thing and the unlimited hack money that's being used for everything we can imagine uh, and, you know, promoting all these negative and divisive ideas in our country. And now that we have a little more control with our federal government in Democratic Party, uh, what's going to, is there anything that can be done to control this or is it just gone now? No, I, I'll give you an example. I mean, HR1, and the companion you know, in the Senate are designed to change the priorities of essentially money driving everything. Mm -hmm. And I think folks on the coast know that I'm the chairman now of the Senate Finance Committee, which is a committee that writes taxes. We deal with trade and Medicare and Medicaid. We got about 60% of the rescue plan. Here's what the effect of money in politics is all about. If you're a nurse on the Oregon coast treating COVID patients, you pay taxes with every paycheck. Your taxes are mandatory. If you are a billionaire in some affluent suburb and you have all kinds of slick accountants and lawyers, the tax code is pretty much optional to you. You can pay what you want, when you want to, and often hardly anything at all. That's when I'm committed to changing. That's why I do all these meetings because the big money, and as I say, the chairman of the finance committee is in a position to make choices about priorities. We're going to uh, be laying out a different approach on the taxing of multinational corporations on Monday. Myself and Sherrod Brown and Mark Warner. Here's a fact to remember. After the Trump tax bill passed in 2017, 
the Joint Committee on Taxation did a report at my request and found that the country's biggest mega corporations, their taxes went down more than 50%. So the politics that's driven by money is something we can do something about. And I'm committed to doing it. That's what I think public service is all about. That's what I'm doing with the chairmanship of arguably one of the most influential committees in public life. Well, thank you, Senator. That's really encouraging. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks for joining us today, Betsy. Uh, next up, we have Dave in Toledo. Dave, you are muted. Do you, there's a button in the bottom left of your screen. Got it. Yep. No, I got it. You're good. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, hi, Senator Wyden. Um, I'm concerned about something that's... Um, that the federal government is actually standing in the way of, which could have alleviated a lot of our problems with, recept, with respect to COVID-19. And that is that, that uh, the government actually prevents us from using um, rabbit antigen tests unless they report to a healthcare provider. And what that means is that we have to pay for, to get a prescription and then pay extra money to get this thing that you know, that will communicate this electronic thing will communicate to the healthcare providers. But there's a simple strip that we could be using to know for ourselves whether we are actually infectious. And, you know, for the life of we, we make it in the United States, we sell it overseas, and the government of the United States says you may not know whether you are infectious or not. And this could have stopped this pandemic in like August. And, you know, so anyway, that's, yeah. that's what I'm asking about. Just in case anybody asks, I, I've just been informed that our U.S. Capitol is now in lockdown, that a vehicle rammed the barricades and two U.S. Capitol uh, officers and a suspect are en route to the hospital. So I may have to step out if, uh, if there's information that requires it. Uh, with respect to your question, sir, I, I have been briefed some on the question of antigen um, testing, and I'm going to be asking the FDA some questions about it. Um, federal health policy, uh, the Finance Committee has jurisdiction over Medicaid, Medicaid, the exchanges, the children's health insurance plan. The FDA is under the committee that Senator Murray of Washington chairs. She handles the FDA, the Centers for Disease Control and the like. So let me have a chance to talk to Senator Murray about it, and then we'll be back at you. I've heard um, uh, from several people, and I want to get you some answers. Okay, I appreciate that. And if I could encourage you to, to listen to or speak to Dr. Michael Mina from uh, Harvard Chan School of Public Health. And um, actually, somebody who knows him very well is Rochelle Walensky, uh, the head of the CDC. And they both agree with this. And, you know, I mean, it's so frustrating that we're in this position when we could have been through this a long time ago. So well, thank you. With, with respect to, you know, COVID, we can, we can make lots of judgments about what, what should have been done. I mean, the fact was um, the... Uh, virus, the pandemic, this public health nightmare was played down again and again, you know, early on. It was clear that it wasn't even clear who was in charge. Sometimes it was federal. Sometimes you thought that the states should do it. And then Jared Kushner would pop up and he would say he's running. So there's a lot of history that supports the proposition that uh, a number of aspects of COVID policy should have been handled very, very differently. We will look into this antigen uh, matter and get back to you quickly. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Dave. And um, we'd be happy to pass along any any of that information to Senator Wyden's staff if you um, want to send it to my email. Um, and, and Senator Wyden, uh, thank you uh, for the for the update about what's going on in the Capitol. Just let us know if if you need to to step away. Um, we do have some some folks in Lincoln County that are not able to join us until the top of the hour here. 
Uh, so we are going to go to a couple questions from the, the Facebook comments. Um, we've got some really great ones so far. So thank you everyone on Facebook for uh, submitting these. Um, we, and we've got one um, relevant to our, to our guests uh, from FEMA. Uh, so Diane uh, asks, um, as so many people who have experienced the Echo Mountain Fire and who have submitted applications to FEMA for their assistance have been denied sometimes over small items on the form, the applicants are forced to appeal those denials. Couldn't there be another level of clarifications? These folks have been through a lot and a denial is harsh when a clarification is all that is needed. FEMA reps in the area uh, would do well to tell people uh, to, to appeal to fix it. Let me pass this um, to our uh, FEMA uh, officials. I do wanna say with respect to the denial rate that this question goes right to the heart of my concerns. If there is something technical and small and it really relates to a box being filled out or a clarification, we're gonna get that fixed. I'm determined to do it because we've got too many Oregonians hurting to see somebody be denied the opportunity to um, protect their family. And uh, that's really what, what it comes down to when we're talking about uh, these kinds of, of, of services. Now, the FEMA people, because I've been in some of these discussions, have also pointed out some of the serious fraud that's taken place. So what we have to do is make sure that there's sort of a sharp line here. Talking about technical matters that are small and the like, we're gonna have to get that resolved and get that quickly. Talking about big things, fraud, we're all against that because fraud means there's less money for the many deserving people who've been hammered by these fires. Let me turn this over to our uh, FEMA officials and thank them for being with us. Who would well, like, uh, hey, Ms. who's gonna speak for FEMA? Federal Coordinating Officer, Tony Ranger. Yes, Mr. Ranger, great. Please, thank you and, for um, being here and pre appreciate the fact that you're participating. My pleasure, sir. Thank you for having us here. Uh, glad to be participating uh, as a federal coordinating officer for this event. I'm now the one who's uh, been appointed to be in charge. So uh, Senator Wyden has asked me to be here. So you're going right to the top of the organization. Uh, and we agree with the citizens questions. Listen, if, if there's some way that we can correct the system, we are currently working through that with our liaisons at the National Processing Center to try and alleviate any of those blockages. Hopefully, if there was uh, an issue with the application when the individual turned it in, that that can be resolved fairly quickly. Some of those things we are now doing over the phone with the applicant. Uh, directly. So if they uh, punched in the wrong social security number, because we know when you applied, you were under a lot of stress and maybe you were moving from the fire or some, there are a lot of reasons why uh, that we can correct some of those things on the spot with the individual to try and expedite getting those funds to the, the person who needs that assistance. So we are looking at that. Some of the other issues do require documentation. Uh, we are trying to expedite that. When you receive a letter that says you've been denied a service, it should indicate what you need to do to create uh, a resolution to that, how you can fix the problem. If your letter doesn't say that, then you need to immediately call back, speak to a representative and, and get that conversation. They should be able to pull up your case, verify who you are, and then talk through that process and try to expedite that as quickly as possible. If that's not occurring, please reach out to the Senator's office, reach out to my office and, and have that conversation with us. And we're here to assist you. I have staff on the ground in Oregon that are prepared uh, to help you walk through this process. That's what they're there for. Mr. Raines, that's, that's helpful and thank you. Is there some kind of document or uh, some kind of communication that FEMA can put out so as to prevent some of these denials as a result of clarifications and technical matters. Has something been put out and developed and people just haven't gotten a copy or tell, tell me what the status is. We could also set up something where you and Fritz Graham, our man on the ground in the, in the area could have a, a few of the people 
come in and they could talk to you about the problems they're they're having. I just think we've got to get this cleared up. What do, what do you think specifically can, we can do from this point on to reduce these kind of denials because of stuff that's technical? Yeah, it's a great question, Senator. Uh, one of the things we we really advocate folks to do is go to the website, disasterassistance.gov, where everyone has their own specific case there. You can look at your your issues specifically, and it will help you walk through that process. We also have a document called uh, Help After a Disaster. And so that kind of walks folks through the process. Some of the most common errors that people make when filling out their application uh, and how we can help correct those in a most rapid and expeditious uh, process. The second part of your question is if there's folks that have questions and a community at large that has questions, by all means, uh, please reach out. Let's coordinate a, a public meeting where we can come together and have our staff present to answer questions. Uh, two ways we normally do it. One is uh, we can answer broad general questions such as we're doing here today, but when we're talking about the specifics of a case for an individual, I usually bring staff with me. They'll sit down, we'll set up, we'll answer your questions specific to that because a lot of it's private in nature and we want to keep it private in nature and not talk about it in the public forum. But we can arrange those. Please reach out to us and we'll coordinate those, those meetings as, as they're available. We'll, we'll have a session along those lines because I've had so many people express this frustration that I appreciate your offer to have a special session. Fritz Graham will be, will be in touch. We'll get some of the um, community members that have bumped up against these, as I say, technical, um, traditionally clerical stuff. But as you correctly said, you know, people are really in a tough spot in their lives. I mean, they're just trying to keep keep their household um, going. So I think I'd like to have one of those dis discussions and we'll um, talk to the community members who are following this and Fritz Graham will be in touch with your, your people. And unless I'm missing something, we should just have a community meeting and kind of air this. Yes, sir, okay. we'll make it happen. I, I, I think that community meeting is, is the way to go. So we'll follow that up. Thank you. Terrific. Well, Diana, I hope, um... I hope you're heartened to see action on that front, and I hope uh, you and your family are are doing well in the recovery process. Um, so keeping on this um, subject line, uh, we've got a question from Riley uh, who asks, with the recent fire evacuation debacle and the tsunami sirens not being entirely effective, there has been talk about providing permanent electronic reader signs over the top of the highways, similar to traffic updates near major Oregon cities that local authorities can have regular messages and events, but in the event of emergencies, they're all changed to emergency alert bodies, tell drivers where to go, uh, how to get there, et cetera. Um, I've spoken as a locally elected councilor and Lincoln City mayoral candidate with Lincoln County Sheriff Curtis Landers, uh, mayors in Lincoln County, and uh, Congressman Kurt Schrader, and they have shown interest in this. Uh, what can you do to help us provide a clear and concise way to provide a safe, evacuation program realized that was a that was a <laughs> quite a number well, of words but it, it's 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 hugely important i was in um lynn county yesterday and we were talking about some of the challenges uh, uh if you have a, a disaster and they were concerned about water and uh, all of these 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 matters are not abstract questions when you're talking about the whole subduction uh, area of debate and, uh, and the like. Um, fortunately, we've got a new Secretary of Transportation. He's young and energetic, and uh, he and I have already been talking about technology questions. And why don't I just make this, uh, this offer to those folks as, as well? Uh, we'll get some of the folks at the Department of Transportation to meet. Um, with uh, with leaders on, on, on the coast. And uh, if they wanna talk about uh, technology improvements as it relates to evac evacuation, particularly on the transportation side, I think we can get uh, people um, associated with the new uh, Secretary of Transportation who came, uh, set up a special discussion with me on, uh, on tech that he wants to pursue um, on his watch and, and we can get that set up too. Great, well, I hope that um... That answers your question, Riley. Uh, we have a question from Ruth Ann. 
Um, Nathan, let yeah. me just mention sure. for the people where there's going to be a follow-up meeting like on FEMA and on this question of transportation tech in terms of evacuations and the like, if those people can get to you, uh, their email, cell phone, whatever it is, we'll have that. We can follow up very quickly. And Fritz Graham from our office is sitting right next to me. We'll, uh, we'll be doing that quickly. Great. I will put my uh, our email for People's Town Hall there in the Facebook chat for folks that have been asking questions on these issues. Um, next question is from Ruth Ann, uh, who says, um, I am a member of the National Active and Retired Federal Employees Association. Uh, please consider co-sponsoring the USPS Fairness Act, S-145, that would eliminate the disastrous pre-funding requirement. I'm looking at that bill, but let's just make it clear here what DeJoy and, and Donald Trump you know, want to do in terms of the po post office, I think was headed towards a very clear objective. They wanted to privatize the postal service. And until there was extraordinary congressional pressure, uh, it was clear that they wouldn't have any problem with making it harder to vote. And, you know, Donald Trump repeatedly attacked vote by mail, even though he used vote, vote, vote by mail. There are some challenges in curtailing his policies because of the structure of the Postal uh, Services um, Governing uh, Board. But I do think that looking at the pension system, which I don't know of any pension system that really operates like that with all of the requirements for uh, pre-funding, pre that contributed to a lot of their, their challenges. And one of the reasons I like vote by mail and giving everybody in America the opportunity um, to do it, and Oregonians have had it now for, for decades. I was the first male in the United States Senator. Gordon Smith, the Republican, was the second male in the United States um, Senator. Is this also would fit well in terms of the post office's mission for the future? Great. Well, thanks for the, the question. Um, sorry, I was. Uh, um... Diana. Um, so next question we have is from, uh, we've had a number of questions on this issue, um, and I'm not sure how familiar you are, Senator Wyden, uh, but uh, another Diane from Lincoln City asks, uh, are you in support of Congressman Simpson's proposal RE breaching? Um, I think this is Congressman Mike Simpson. Yeah, this is, this is the debate uh, Nathan, about the future of the Snake River dams and the Simpson proposal really kind of puts front and center the whole discussion of, of people's uh, livelihoods. I mean, what I'm interested in now is making sure that communities in the basin and the Columbia River Basin get heard. I mean, this is about recovering salmon runs. It's about the economic vitality of the um, region. And I think folks have heard me say that these big natural resources issues, you've got to build a coalition. I've been part of two recently, the Oahe in Eastern Oregon, not far from where the Bundys did so much to harm the wildlife um, refuge. Uh, we brought together the farmers and the environmentalists. It took a full year to do essentially all that work, but you know something, the conflict in that area had gone on for decades and decades. Our river democracy proposal, uh, normally bills get written in Washington, DC. I went out all across the state of Oregon. We took 15,000 nominations. We spent a lot of time making sure that private property was protected, that we dealt with fire risks. So resources questions require that you spend a lot of time to balance the interest of stakeholders and I've made it clear uh, to the uh, Idaho congressional delegation, I am happy to be part of this because this uh, proposal relates to rivers, relates to salmon, relates to breaching the lower Snake River um, dams. Uh, the congressman said, when asked, would this save salmon, said, well, I'm not sure. 
So there are a lot of science issues that are important here too. And that's, like I said, whether it's Iwahi, whether it's river democracy, whether it's my plan for taking the uh, energy tax provisions in the federal tax code and throwing them in the garbage can, which I proposed. Now have 25 senators supporting that. Uh, they take time to bring people together, but that's the Oregon way and I'm prepared to do it. Great. Uh, we have a, another FEMA related question from David uh, who asks <clears throat> or says, 30 manufactured homes at the Salmon River Mobile Village on Highway 18 were lost in the Echo Complex fire. Seven months later, there has been no debris removal. FEMA has declined to help, and at my urging, ODOT is now starting to clean up at the state expense. Why Nathan, has... Nathan, yes. um, because I was trying to handle pieces of paper being <laughs> given to me. Sure. Could you start that question over again? Sure. Uh, so this is uh, addressed to FEMA, uh, but certainly I'm sure they'd welcome your feedback as well. Um, 30 manufactured homes at the Salmon River Mobile Village on Highway 18 were lost in the Echo Complex fire. Seven months later, there has been no debris removal. FEMA has declined to help. And at my, the questioner's urging, ODOT is now starting to clean up at state expense. Why has FEMA declined to help these people? Mr. Raines. It's a great Did you question. hear that question? Yes, sir. Uh, great question. And uh, what I would like to do on the phone with us today is Stan Thomas uh, from the Office of Oregon Emergency Management, who oversees this type of project. Uh, FEMA is here to support the state in everything they do and the recovery for Oregonians. So I would yield to uh, Mr. Thomas and uh, let him answer the question. Oh, Mr. Raines, before we do a whole bunch of Senate yielding, as you know, when your top officials were out, the big focus of mine was debris mm -hmm. removal because everything else is uphill if you don't do it. And I've been under the impression that a lot of the debris has been removed. So we got to get this done quickly, quickly, because this was up at the top of our list months ago. So let's, yes, hear, from, let's hear from the Oregon um, officials, but when we're done with this call, we gotta have a plan to get that debris cleaned up. Okay. Yes, yes sir, and, and we agree with you 100%. We have approved the uh, personal property debris removal for the state of Oregon uh, with your leadership and guidance. Thank you for uh, the support of that. Uh, and we have approved that for the state of Oregon to move forward with that debris removal. We, we want to continue to work with you, but as you know, when your top officials were out here, that was the number one thing I talked about, because if you don't get that debris removed, you can't move on to the other aspects of getting your life together. Now, I guess Mr. Thomas is on my screen from OEM. Mr. Thomas, what are we going to do so we leave this call and that debris is going to get removed? Yes, uh, thank you, Senator, and, and thank you, Mr. Raines. And it's a, it's a good question, and it's a huge huge challenge of debris removal throughout the state. Um, debris removal being a very complex issue uh, between home ownership, uh, commercial private property, private property insurance. Uh, the state of Oregon early on made the decision to uh, cover the cost of all debris removal, regardless of whether it was el eligible for FEMA reimbursement. So. Um, I, I, I do want to say that FEMA has been very supportive uh, through the debris removal process, but it is a process that uh, the state of Oregon and under the governor's uh, direction and guidance, uh, it, it's a very much a, an Oregon operation. We have uh, debris removal um, operations uh, throughout all the corridors that were affected and over on the Echo Mountain fire. Um, it's it's been complicated in getting the debris picked up throughout the entire state. We did complete the household hazardous waste removal, which has to be done, or what we call phase one, is removing the, the hazardous debris or hazardous waste from those properties early on. And now we are into phase two. So we do have work ongoing in Lincoln County. Um, we we would have, you know, we all want it uh, done yesterday, but uh, we are moving in Lincoln County and the other five counties. Uh, that were impacted by these fires. 
So the Salmon River Park is actually uh, a specific case where it is commercial property. Um, they are working on getting it cleaned up. Uh, ODOT's active there. Um, I don't have uh, in front of me the, the date that we expect to be completed in Lincoln County, but those operations are ongoing. Um, we can, um, if you uh, are able to or can Google, and I'll put it in the chat for Nathan to maybe to post uh, the website that you can track debris removal and even to the degree of if you have property that's waiting for that debris removal, you can uh, enter your property and see when they're expected to be there to clean it up. So I don't know if that answers the entire question, but it is active. It is an ODOT and state-led operation. Let, let's make sure Nathan is the person who asked the question on the. They're on. They're on Facebook, so I okay. I can't tell if they are oh. currently watching. I suspect they are. But, but Nathan, I understood the questioner to say in that specific area there had been nothing done on debris removal at all. Is that? Do you have the question in front of you? They said there's been no debris removal, and then later in the question they said ODOT is now starting to clean up. So okay. presumably some some action has been taken on ODOT. So, Mr. Thomas, you know, we do a lot of work with you all, a lot of work with Mr. Raines. It has been six months since the start of the fire, give or take. This has got to get done. So, um, gentlemen, I'm going to make sure Fritz Graham talks to you as soon as this meeting is over. He's going to be in touch with these Facebook people, and we're just going to be following this now um, every step of the way because six months, I mean, it's one thing um, after a disaster and our whole valley coast is really so many parts of, of those communities got hammered. We understand there's a lot of work to do, but six months from the start of the fire, if one of our constituents says that, you know, nothing has happened and I gather that at the end of this Facebook uh, question they said well something is starting we just got to move now so Mr. Graham um, will be with both of you um, Mr. Thomas Mr. Raines because we're going to get this done for those folks it can't be after six months that we're still kind of you know in some preliminary this and that we got to get that debris out and as both of you gentlemen know that was my number one concern when the FEMA top officials came out after the fire. And, and frankly, I think a lot of progress has been made in a lot of places on debris removal. But if you're not making progress in your neighborhood, then you're not making progress. So we got to get on top of it. Gentlemen, um, we'll be contacting you and I'm going to bird dog this until we get that debris taken care of. Understood? Certainly. Thank you, Senator. Thanks. Great. Uh, it looks like we have Colleen on the line via phone. Um, Colleen, if you're able to unmute yourself, uh, uh, feel free to ask your question. Hi, thank you. And thank you, Senator Wyden, for making the effort to do these virtual town halls. It's definitely appreciated. Uh, my name is Colleen Weiler. I live in Newport, Oregon. Um, and I just wanted to pass my thank you on to the Senator for his work on the River Democracy Act, which is a fantastic example um, of collaboration and cooperation to protect Oregon's beautiful rivers and watersheds. And on that similar note, ask uh, what his thoughts are on Congressman Mike Simpson's proposal for salmon and watershed protection and restoration throughout the Northwest and if he is planning on um, engaging and helping to kind of refine um, and, and make that proposal a little bit better than it currently is and, and put it into practice for salmon restoration. Colleen, we just had a fairly involved discussion on the Simpson um, proposal before you came uh, on. And obviously this is extraordinarily important to the region. We're talking about the future of, uh, of the snake uh, peoples economic livelihoods, the vitality of the salmon. And I just said, you know, we got to use the kind of approach that we use to pull together the Awahi coalition in a place where there have been fighting for decades. We've got the farmers and the environmental community. And then of course, in the River Democracy Act, where we literally said, this bill is not going to be written in Washington, DC. It's going to be written in Oregon. 
the 15,000 nominations. In that bill, people are gonna ask me, well, what does it mean for private property? Protections for private property in that legislation are specifically referenced something like eight or nine times in the text of the bill. So um, we're gonna work with uh, the Congressman and I've already been talking to Senator uh, Crapo and Senator Risch, the Idaho senators about it as well. So these, these issues that are so vital to the area you know, require that you pull everybody together and that's the Oregon way, get, get people of disparate interests and find common ground. Terrific. Colleen, did you have a follow-up? Um, well, I guess um, I, I thank you for that answer and I definitely support um, the coalition building aspect in the Oregon way and wondering if Senator Wyden has thoughts on how we do that. Well, what, what we do, quaint idea, is exactly what we did with the Owyhee. You bring people together, you basically say, let's see if we can find 50% of the concerns that all parties share and get them addressed you know, first. And then you just move you know, down the line to deal with the bigger and more, more contentious issues. Colleen, you know this, it's not very flashy. It's not very sensational. You can't just you know, put your hand in, in some kind of bag and, and pull, pull out a rabbit. But um, I've just been part of doing it in two major issues, the Oahe and, uh, and river, river Democracy. Same with respect to my climate bill, where I want as chairman of the Finance Committee to throw the 44 provisions of the tax code in the garbage can, OK? Gone. So um, I'm ready to be part of an effort to do the heavy lifting to address these issues. Great. Well, thanks for joining us, Colleen. Um, I will pass along, not really a question, but in the Facebook comments, uh, there's been a pretty vigorous discussion on Facebook. Um, Patty adds, debris removal still has not happened at the camp for disabilities in Gates, uh, upward bound. Um, changing, unless anyone has any uh, response there. Oh, Go ahead. Oh, oh, this is so important to the communities and to me as their senator, for all who have, because Nathan has said now that there's lots of people talking about debris removal, for those that are concerned about it, I would like you to get to Nathan at People's Town Hall phone numbers and uh, emails and the like. And I think Mr. Raines and Mr. Thomas, I think we need to have another meeting on debris removal. So. If all these people are saying six months in, we're still kind of not getting there. So I think we got two separate sessions um, now, one on the applications, make sure that people aren't getting, um, getting put aside for some clerical error and second on debris removal. Cause you know, we're six months in, we gotta, we gotta get this done now. And, and I'm just gonna be bird dogging it every step of the way. That, that's, that's what I'm gonna be doing. Fritz Graham is, as good a public official as there is, and he's going to be a busy fellow after this meeting. Um, what I encourage Fritz to also take a look at the Facebook too, because I, I, for folks watching, I am trying to grab as many of your uh, terrific questions and comments as possible. If I do not get to yours, um, you know, no, no personal, nothing personal. Um, we've got a different topic from Lee, uh, who asks, "What's the latest news on net neutrality becoming a law?" Well, I'm, I'm a very strong supporter of net neutrality. And I actually introduced the first proposal uh, to make net neutrality a federal law in the Senate. And for those who are always wondering what it really means, is net neutrality means is after you pay your internet access fee, you get to go where you want, when you want, and how you want. And everybody is treated equally. Now. There's a big push by some powerful far right interests to change that. And they'd sort of like to have an information arist aristocracy, where if you were wealthy, you get preferential treatment and special lanes and shorter times and the like. And so now um, with a new administration, um, a new acting chair at the Federal Communications Commission, we're renewing our push for uh, net neutrality and 
the fellow who's been the sponsor in the House, Ed Markey, is now in the Senate. So you got two sponsors in the Senate. The original bill was um, Senator Mark, uh, then Congressman Markey and I. So I'm all in on this fight. I mean, it is a hugely consequential matter in terms of the future of the internet and particularly standing up for the people who don't have power and clout. A sort of related issue is what's called Section 230, which I, um, which I wrote. And I think if you didn't have Section 230, um, groups like the Me Too movement would have trouble getting off, off the ground because they were taking on some of the most powerful people in our, our society. And I think without that um, you know, protection, I'm not sure that they could have been able to get their stories out. So when you're talking about net neutrality, talking about Section 230, for me, the question is about protecting voices that don't have power and clout. And, uh, you know, the big guys take care of themselves. You know, Facebook and, and Google, they got lobbyists and, uh, and the like. And by the way, they used to be small and they were interested in these issues. Now they're big and they're happy to draw up the drawbridge and keep everybody else out. Great. Uh, well, we have time for one last question. And again, thank you uh, for everyone on Facebook for sharing your questions and experiences. Um, we have a question from Carol in Newport, who who asks um, or has sort of a prompt about COVID relief checks being delayed uh, for people on Social Security and potentially withheld for people on disability. I've not heard about uh, checks being withheld on disability, but we clearly would go after that. I mean, Nathan, what has been an issue is people who had direct deposit, they, to a great extent, have gotten their checks. People who don't, there's been more challenge. And uh, if you all who are concerned about that and give our office a call, we'll follow it up. And, and of course, delaying checks for disabled folks is absolutely unacceptable. And if people get that to us, we'll follow that up too. Okay. Uh, Carol, if you're watching, um, feel free to send along your info. Um, so that is, you know, we're nearing the end of our program. Um, if we did not get to your question, uh, hopefully some similar topics were addressed. Uh, thank you so much for everyone watching on Facebook for joining on the Zoom today. Um, uh, Senator Wyden, any parting thoughts for us? Can I uh, make a comment about uh, an issue that I'm surprised nobody talked about today? And that is the filibuster. I want everybody in Lincoln County to know that I very much favor what's called a talking filibuster. So that if a Senator feels strongly about an issue, they should have to show up and actually be accountable and not just file a motion to object and then go off and play golf with a bunch of lobbyists somewhere. And this has special ramifications for our state because shortly after I came to the Senate, the House of Representatives made an incredibly bad decision, by the way, over, over the opposition of the Oregon delegation to throw our death with dignity law which we voted for twice in the garbage can. And so the House of Representatives voted to get rid of what Oregonians had voted for twice. Came to the Senate, all the powerful senators were for it. Everybody thought Oregon was gonna get rolled. And I said, look, people in my state feel strongly about this. Historically, Oregon's been able to make its own decisions on these kinds of matters. You better be prepared because I'm going out on the floor of the United States Senate. I'm going to protect Oregon. I'm going to stand up for Oregon. I'm going to speak about what this means. And by the way, it was a horrible bill. It didn't just affect death with dignity. It made it harder for doctors to treat patients for pain. And when the dust settled, I really didn't even have to go out there and be Jimmy Stewart and talk for hours. It was kind of funny at the beginning, everybody was sending me cookies and sandwiches and the like. And they go say, well, you know, Ron's a basketball player, but he looks pretty skinny. Let's make sure he gets enough food if he's gonna do one of these filibusters. I really didn't have to go out and talk for 15 or 16 hours. I spoke a couple of times on nothing like what you saw in the Jimmy Stewart movie, but the fact that I had enough time 
to explain to senators on both sides of the aisle, which the prospect of a talking filibuster gave me, is the reason that Oregon's death with dignity law is on the books today. I believe it would be in the trash can had I not protected it at that crucial time. So talking filibuster is something I think is fair to all sides and you have issues dealt with um, expeditiously and fairly. So nobody asked about it, but I think I wanted to make sure folks um, knew about it. And I just really appreciate on a pretty day, I'm looking out the window, um, Lincoln County always coming through for democracy, always with factual pointed questions, always saying they wanna hold elected officials accountable. They've given us a lot to follow up on and everybody in Lincoln uh, County it's a great, great honor to represent you in the United States Senate. And uh, for purposes of today, we thank Nathan and People's Town Hall. And uh, these discussions are in the to be continued department. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, Senator Wyden. We'll see you all.